distinct members of the Aviation Roundtable, Team Aviation Roundtable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All of you, Aviation Roundtable. Um, haven't done that, so we'll take the national and send down. Um, I'll let you bring my boys and boys. Can we please rise? Working relationship with government 
and knowledge sharing with all stakeholders. That is their objective. We are not straining, we don't stray away from that. We don't stray away from that. We don't want to look into any direction different from this focus. In the last five years of this regime, how has our airlines fared? How has our airport fared? The Nigerian people and the foreigners that visit us, are they happy with our airports? Skipol imported in 40 years or 42 years ago at MMA. Is this still a pride of the people? Abuja recently completed without car parks. Are, they, is it, are we happy with it? So what's the role of government intervention in airports and airlines? That worries me. On that note, I will leave that to the very wise men on this high platform to do justice to. The topic today, aviation industry in Nigeria beyond 2025. Thank you very much. Hey, the topic of today is a reflection, is a testament of that thought. To know that we have to think beyond a regime. We have to think beyond an administration because whoever is there today, a nation was there before and will be there tomorrow. So that is a very, a very big thing. And I congratulate the President and the whole Aviation Roundtable team for thinking and being that way. It is also important to notice that, and this is my view, my personal but very well thought and strongly held view, that the absence and presence today says something about our country, Nigeria. Actually, it says a lot. By this time tomorrow, I'll be in Oxford sharing a round table on 20 years of Nigerian democracy. It's a big event in the African Study Center, so I'll be leaving from here to the airport to attend that in the morning. I'll say that the present and absence of today says something about us because the truth is part of the, the crux, part of what matters, what is the result of our problem is that we seem to be allergic to thinking and planning. We seem to struggle with the idea of really thinking things through, having a long-term plan and sticking to it. To think thoroughly, the process is to engage stakeholders who leave the issue you want to discuss, to engage those who invest in it, those who really have something at stake, those who have earned their position, and I say this, the minister is my friend, like many of the public figures. I like to remind public figures that there's a difference between them and business people. You see, most business people earn their place on the table. Not nomination, not vote for me, not like me. <laughs> there are people who have put their money, their career to be around that table. So a round table like this elsewhere, and this is why I was fighting it, also experience. Elsewhere, the people who are there are people who actually have something at stake. Because their thinking is a thinking that affects their life truly, whatever is decided. There are people who, if they get it wrong, it's their job, it's their business, it's their career at stake. It's not something they just do on working and out. Elsewhere in the world, in that world that we admire, that we use as reference, the simple trick is that there are a lot of round tables like this that every policy they make, every plan, comes out like this one. So to that extent, I think the absence and presence is a symptom and indication of what is going on in Nigeria. But by nature, I'm positive, but I'm not to this. At least I'm trying to see where the solution is. I also think the solution lacks in that absence and presence. I think that those who do, employers of labor, capitalists of industries, investors, people managers, those who deal with the everyday life of the sector, need to understand that they need to up their game and start acting with their government. I 
think people inside this room in Nigeria need to understand their work, their importance. It's an ontological call. I think people need to understand their real importance and find ways of doing things the way it ought to be done, the professional way. A round table today is around a very important discussion. It is not a time to blame, it is not a time to justify, it is not a space to hide things. It's a forum to think freely. After all, you know, people have been sacrificed to be here and are here on time. There's no price, no premium for whatever I said. Nobody's going to be shamed. Our participants will say what they know and easily say, I don't know this. And somebody else will know it. We say it. It's not a place to score points. I'm hoping that the public, when it's time to ask questions, will not ask sharp questions. Don't ask questions to embarrass anybody. Don't ask questions to express your frustration. It's a conversation to understand what is going on and to find situation. So, we should start, and um, we go straight to the point. I recap to say, thinking of aviation 25 tells you that we're thinking of a continuum. That is what business people do. You think of a long-term thing that allows you to plan. That is what strategy is about. Thinking, okay, in this long period, what do we want to achieve? What are the variables that will affect us? What are the prospects? What are the problems? What are the possible solutions to all these things? Now, without holding you much, we we'll start our conversation, and I'm going to start with some of very glad to share the um, panel with today because he occupies one of those roles where elsewhere in the world it's one of the most important offices. We just don't get it in Nigeria. And luckily, we have a lawyer occupying that role as well, so it's a double whammy for us if things are done properly. The DG and CEO of the Consumer Protection Council. Um, Mr. Babatunde Irekura Esquire, as we say, we're very glad to have you here, and I shall see you for you to commence your intervention. Thank you very much. Beyond 2025, what are the important things? For profitability, airline business models must change. Secondly, the airport experience must change. Airports all over the world today have now become a comfort zone, not a travel port. There are far more commercial managers and commercial attendants in JFK, Shkipo, DBX, then you have security, customs, and immigration officers put together. With the record of delay in our airports, Nigeria still records one of the highest numbers of no-shows or people arriving late for their flights. You must ask yourself, why would that be the case? Traffic in Lagos is not much different from traffic in New York. Tokyo. But the average traveler in Nigeria is gaming the whole situation and trying to arrive at the airport just prior to departure. Whereas in this other environment, the average traveler is saying, it doesn't matter, let me go down there, I'll be fine. Even the VIP, the premium class sitting experience in an airport is not comparable to the general sitting experience in other airports. Now imagine what the general passenger, all he wants to do is arrive at the airport, be able to get through security and proceed to body. And we all know when we're gaming it, we're likely to lose it. So, this is what will compete in 2025 and beyond. We must be able to transform our aviation that aviation itself moves people 
improves trade, but stimulates business outside of it. There is a popular saying that in the airline business, the airline makes the least money. Because those who supply them newspaper, those who give them their food and everything, they seem to just make more money than them because of margins. But the airlines stimulate that business. There is no reason why we shouldn't have an international flight that arrives in Nigeria at 10 a.m. and will not depart until 2 or 3 or 4 p.m. But what will make that happen is that we have an airport experience that can keep that thing on ground and encourage the operator of that aircraft to bring people from other places, other African countries, and combine them at that our own airport experience hall. That will do two things. It will improve regional and domestic travel as well as put us truly on the map for international travel. And because I am a competition and consumer protection regulator, in there you find competition. In there you find passenger experience. We must rethink what really is our model. And I'm challenging you in here that we should start paying attention to that. We have a challenge of growing our domestic airline. Until I took this job, I didn't travel that much within Africa. But in the past year and a half, I have come to recognize the sad reality of a continent, especially in the west of the continent, where connectivity is poor. And you know what? Traveling within Africa is more expensive than traveling within Europe more expensive than travel within North America and far more expensive than travel within Asia. And you're talking about vast areas. Coast to coast, New York to California, longer flight than London to New York. Yet, cheaper than Lagos to Banjul. Travel to Banjul recently, and left from Abuja to Accra, from Accra to Lume, Lume to Freetown, Freetown to Monrovia, before finally arriving Banju. I was sorry for those who were still going to Dakar, because after Banju they went to Dakar. And so a colleague of mine who was on that flight and going to Dakar, I said, when you are coming back, pick me up, which is exactly what happened. He picks me up, I said, let's go pick the guys in Monrovia now. And then we went. To stay in the aircraft in all these trips. The only place where we changed was in Lumen. To come out and then go to Kotoka. Lumen to Lagos is what? But I still went to Ghana first. <laughs> Traveled recently also to Livingstone in Zambia. And I'm one for looking at the map in the plane when you're traveling. I feel South African Airways. I flew over Livingstone to Johannesburg. Then from Johannesburg back to Livingstone. But that's not the saddest part of the story. The only connection when I was coming back from Livingstone was to arrive by South African Airways again in Johannesburg. And my flight into Johannesburg arrived at 1.25. But it was too close for I think uh, 2 o'clock departure to Lagos. When I walked into Oliver Tambo, I could see Lagos body. But I couldn't get on my I couldn't get on that flight. So the way my ticket was written was a 24 hour wait in Johannesburg. And that was what it was. And I can give you story after story. Recently I traveled to South Africa again. In South Africa Airways, by the time we got to the airport, they had just started a strike. I ended up in a hotel for about 14 hours to wait for a sky. It took me from Johannesburg. I can't remember the first place it took me to. Then it took me to Douala. 
before bringing you to labor. And I wanted to end up in Abuja. That's the story of the video. That's the story of the video, and we must ask ourselves why. Because it is not unprofitable. It really is not unprofitable. But with a proper consumer protection and competition regime, Honestly, it's only a question of time before we begin to see the end of the model we are operating. There is a generation coming behind us that do not have the nationalistic proclivities that we have. Those guys, if we don't figure the best way out, those guys will put a British Airways plane in Abuja that will go to Kano, that will come to Lagos, that will go to Kaduna, that will go to Maiduguri. I guarantee you. Let us not make any mistake about it. I guarantee you. And we will be alive to see it happen. We just won't be in the seats to control it. And so we must think differently. We have fought and we have resisted and we have stayed. But because of what is happening around the world, our staying power is diminishing. Whether we know it or not, our staying power is diminishing. And so we must move. We must move. And I'd like to close by saying, my, I have one daughter. My wife, is one of those people who doesn't like to buy anything online. She wants to see what she's buying. So, I call her a mall friend. You know, and one of her worst heartbreaks is to have just this one daughter who doesn't like to go to the mall. My daughter buys everything online. Brick and mortar giving way to e-commerce. We have to get to a point where there's survivability for airlines. We have to get to a point where the airlines can truly have the capacity to grow and to survive. We have to get to a point where our airports are no longer ports. We have to get to a point where aviation truly stimulates business. Nothing creates jobs in the world today more than retail. So imagine if we had an airport that's in more. And in closing, to our regulators who are here, I'm talking about our airport operator and the Civil Aviation Regulatory Authority, there's work to be done. But we must come out of that sense of just a small group of professionals in aviation who know it. Because the world has long gone past that. We must engage with commerce and those who do retail and who do commerce so that we will be better able to focus more on the core of our work. Things like safety, security, passing, because these other commercial people, they know how to operate their businesses very well. Airport managers in most parts of the world now are commercial people. They're looking at the vast majority of the airport from a, how much dollar per square feet. That's how they're, that's how they're looking at an airport. And so, when you walk through the airport in Abuja, for instance, and see the amount of open space, you are saying, how much dollar is going? Yeah. And so, please, all I have to say is that the industry that will survive after 2025 is one that will be nimble. It's one where 
when people get on those planes, the last worry they have is whether they are safe. It's one where when travel time is coming, people are not thinking about the convenience of the airport. They're more worried about the concerns of getting there. That is the industry beyond 2025. And if you cannot see people who are not here that are ready to operate this industry beyond 2025, then we have done something fundamentally wrong. We have not created an industry that is positioned to thrive beyond our own time. Thank you very much and good morning. There are so many issues that your own issue might be forgotten. So what you're doing this morning is letting the world know that there are very many issues in the air transportation sector. And these issues, if Nigeria like, likes itself, should not be underestimated. But I like to say that when you look at the aviation sector, the optics of it, not very good. The osmosis of it, not acceptable. The ecosystem of it uh, cannot be appreciated. What I say optics, the ordinary man in the field, uh, if you ask him what he thinks of aviation, he only knows about airlines and the aircraft. It doesn't feel too safe. You may have known that when people are in the aircraft about to take off, they are full of signs of the cross, uh, holding their rosaries and saying, uh, we see me lie. They, they just have to travel. Whereas you're supposed to go in comfort. People just resign themselves. Uh, like, Leo uh, Warrior, Lua, and Mufia, Mimi, And that need not be. Because when you then want to fly the leg from Europe to somewhere else, you feel a little bit more secure. That shouldn't be. So I believe the optics can be improved upon. I also believe that the osmosis can be improved upon. When I say osmosis, uh, very many people in the transport section, especially the pilots, several of them are frustrated. Some of them are asking themselves, why did I become a pilot? If I can't find a job, or if I'm holding a job that is less than fulfilling. So, all the voices of it is such that Nigerian pilots tend to look for greener pastures. So, the flow, osmotically, is centrifugal to Nigeria. In other words, people tend to leave Nigeria. By the way, it's not just by the way of pilots, lawyers, doctors, uh, they tend to do so. Now, but the ecosystem also is very important. You look at um, the whole of the airline sector, the air uh, transport section, and you find that you, you, you can do with a bit more solidarity among the various stakeholders. Somebody has to think about the consolidation of uh, the various actors, so that if we all act in tandem and we are well synchronized, then the issues can be faced as a team. The issues can then be teased and uh, readdressed. And by issues, I mean the following. The issue of um, air transportation policy. There must be an updated policy on air transportation, not only formulated, but implemented. There are, there are issues of management in the various uh, sections within the air transportation uh, sector. There is the issue of decaying facilities. There is the issue of security and safety. And then there is the issue of accident records. But I believe that these things can be solved by our repeatedly bringing it to light. Again, I congratulate uh, Dr. Gabriel Lowe and his team for doing this. Uh, but we must continue uh, in a very determined way to make this happen. 
But I think one of the biggest problems, I, I was listening now to Baba today, he's a very brilliant mind. His analysis has been as if he was in court. And um, if I was the judge, I would have uh, ruled in his favor. <laughs> but the fundamental problem we have in Africa, ladies and gentlemen, is the way governance is approached. And as long as you have the kind of governance strategy we have throughout Africa, not just uh, here in Nigeria, uh, as, as long as you have that, a situation where sometimes the worst of us is exploiting the best of us and getting away with it, then you are here making all the grammar. Those who should make the uh, decisions are not even aware or are not capable of analyzing profitably some of our problems. I always pity some pilots, some of them very experienced, who would come and tell us on air what needs to be done. Who is listening? Who is listening? And uh, unless and until we consolidate ourselves here and make our points cloudy, uh, we just might have problems continuing. If you are a student of history, you would know that somebody called Patrice Lumumba became the president by popular vote of uh, the Congo, the R C in 1960. And you know, of course, what happened, the showbiz of this world uh, with the uh, assistance of the international uh, bodies took him up, seized him, and killed him in very, very, uh, very uh, despicable circumstances. But one of the things he said before he died uh, was as follows. He said, no, no, les Africains, nous avons perdu le temps de développement. Which means we, we Africans, who have lost the train of development. 1960, looks like he was prophesying because when you look at Africans and African governments, uh, what's, what's the progress we have made? Something has to be done. Something has to give. Otherwise, as somebody was saying, sooner than you think, there may be no airlines uh, that are African in nature. They may be coming from other areas. Uh, and they're in your very before, they're just ruling you. Uh, in vain, do you wear all these fancy, fancy caps? I think that somebody has to start addressing the fundamental issue of politics. But I don't want to bring your pressures up. I want to tell you that Nigeria will still make it. Nigeria has more potential for development than 90% of the countries in this world. But Nigeria has to wake up. Nigeria has to realize that 80% of the jobs that are now available were not available 10 years ago. Nigeria has to realize that in 10 years time, 65% of the jobs that were there are not existing now, which means we are moving in quantum, not just by arithmetical, but by geometrical uh, progression. We have to be ready for it, just in case it comes. We must stop being just mere purchasers of ready-made goods from overseas, or users. Some of the people are using some of the most sophisticated machines, like telephones in this country, but they are using less than 2% of the availability. I believe, therefore, that we need to wake up the younger generation to be aware that way we educate them of their responsibility to make Africa more proud but be more African fundamentally. It will happen. Otherwise, the alternative is not funny. But that's just all speeches. Again, uh, as patron, I want to wish you all well. And I want to remind you that in 1970, a young man called uh, Jose Feliciano went to record a few things. He was a musician. He's still a musician. Um, and then it was all just before Christmas. So he recorded about three or four on the tape. And the producer says, hey, 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 we still have a little space left. How are you going to fill it? Scratching his head, and then said, well, okay. 
and he filled it with some words. Now, life is what happens to you when you are planning something else. That little one minute that was left filled by him became more popular than all the other things he had spent years to record. And what's that song that he sang that is now more downloaded than any other song in this festive season? It is called Feliz Navidad. And he says, Feliz Navidad, Prospero Año Felicitas. And I think that even though we are having problems, we must also say that uh, the atmosphere can be made happy. So please join me as I say, Feliz Navidad, Feliz Navidad, Feliz Navidad, Prospero Año Felicidad. I wish you a happy day. We had the, um, the DG of Consumer Protection tell us a few things. I would like us, before we go on to the next stage, to interact with him directly so we can post some um, comments and questions with the provisors that they are short so that I'm straight to the point so that we can go into, um, into everything. Uh, Dr. Lowe, I will drag you into this conversation because I um, don't think you are done. As we open it up to people, I would like to see some questions and comments. It is not my habit to recap what the speaker says, because I'm always saying people should be should, should pay attention. No need to recap. So I'll do it once. That, then after that, we should all pay attention when the speakers speak. There are some key points that came out from what the DG said. He talked about transmitting values and preparing for tomorrow, which means that industry leaders need to understand and I translate in my words, they need to defend their values and pass it on for those who take over tomorrow. And it's a big challenge, which I've had for us to say many times. There is no history of sectors and industries. Pilots, managers to be in aviation do not know the icons of their industry. You know, we should know the first pilot, the first big manager, a GM, a director of productions, operations, head of protocols. These are studies that should be done and should be propagated in industry. Not everybody should be following Munambi Azika and Awolo. You know, there, there, there's more to life. Those are very fundamental things, but there is more to life in professions and in business. And since the rest of the world do not want to appreciate industries, I think industries have the duty of pushing themselves forward to be known. Maybe we should charge the ART to develop a good unit for research and promotion of history and ideas. I, I see the research, you said, with, and, and we get them to sponsor it. Fun is there, other people. You put them together and, and you force them to promote this. For profit, says Baba Tune Rekwa, airlines need to change their model if they want to make profit. That is the, for profitability, the way we're doing is not good enough. And I agree with him. He also made note that our airports, the way they're structured and operated, will not work in 20, 25 as we go up. He says, we cannot keep staying. So far, what we've tried to do is to stay. We need to move on, he said. I quote him saying, we must move. We must move in terms of geography, to conquer new areas, new markets. We must move in terms of diversification of modes of operandi and how we do it. The telephone has become the shop for most people. We need to, what I call the three Ds, digitalize, decentralize, and devolve our actions. And I pass on, and I start with questions, and other people should ask and comment now. My question to him is just, he talked about models. Is it safe to say that in reality, there has never been a clear, organic Nigerian model for aviation business. Is, the, is there one I'm missing, or, or there is not? You know, I say this because those of us who have had a boring life enough to study aviation models will tell you that there's a difference between the Ryanair model and the BA model, and what has happened in France, and we know the limit between of um, Air One and Alitalia in Italy. So, you know, there are, Different models say, some of them just nuances, but they exist. Have we 
I went really hard in Nigerian model for innovation business. Has it been cut or not? I told to you, hoping Dr. Lowe will comment as well, and to the house, really. Nigerian innovation business model. Thank you very much. The one thing I might start with is that there's no country in the world today where you have more individuals owning airlines than in Nigeria. It's no country in the world. And the the two legitimate cartels in the world today. Uh, it's argumentative, but from a competition regulator standpoint, I can say that we understand two legitimate cartels. Nigeria is a member of one. It's those who do not produce oil prefer to regard OPEC as a cartel because it controls production, coordinates uh, discussion between members for price. The other cartel, not illegally so called, but somewhat improperly so referred to, are airline alliances and loyalty programs. There's no Nigerian airline that belongs in an alliance. This system of doing business has come to stay. And the reality is, unless we can come up to a point where we can belong in an alliance or belong in a code share, we will struggle. Two days ago, I was in a press conference with the Federal Road Safety Commission, and we have a summit tomorrow with fleet operators. And what you see happening in the airline industry is happening in road transport. They're doing you know, interconnectivity. And so ABC picks you from Lagos. You say you're going to Oka, gets to Oweri, gives you to another local transporter. Because his uh, 80 seater bus will not have enough passengers to go to Oka. And so from Oweri, they give you to a smaller operator. And so the conversation we intend to have with the fleet transporters is when you're giving that passenger to someone else in Oweri, you must, we don't mind, but it must be a transporter that you have a relationship with. The reason why someone chose ABC, they looked at your maintenance, they looked at your timeliness, they looked at your security, and they made a choice. So it must be someone who you can say adopts similar standards and who your insurance coverage can run through without exemption. And if we can now be going to the point of as regulators seeking to enforce that in something as simplistic as road transportation, it must be something that is enforceable in something that is as sophisticated as air transportation. And so, we must devise methods of building our capacity. The regulators must come to a point where operational sustainability is that an airline operates at a certain level that those recognized global standards that allow for admission into code share, admission into alliances, are the operational standards that are domestically operational. Once that is the case, our airlines will have the capacity to belong in those. And you leave us, the competition regulators, if we meet the standards and they don't admit us, we know exactly what to do. But to the extent that the reason why we're not admitted is because we do not operate to a certain acceptable standard. We don't, there's, no, there's no response to that. And so that's why I feel that our model must change. Our model simply must change. We will not compete favorably if all we're still able to do 
is point to point. It is actually anti-consumer protection. The, 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 internationally, the percentage of point to point travelers is less than 22%. From origination to destination, point to point internationally is less than 22%. And for a consumer, and for a consumer, the only way that your travel experience can be good is, I don't want to know, I mean, nobody goes to Wakanda online and says he wants to go to JFK and says, I'm looking, and starts for a flight, say, London, and Lagos, Amsterdam, to JFK, if he has nothing to do in Amsterdam. He just goes to his origination city, and what's his destination? The system works out the best connection. And so imagine that in all of the trade that is going on online between Lagos and New York, we don't feature at all. We don't even feature, in fact, sorry, not from Lagos to New York, in the trade that is going from Oweri to New York, we don't feature. We don't feature. You cannot find a pricing on online, whether Expedia, Orbitz, Wakanda, that will give you a pricing from Oweri to New York. So just look at the amount of business we've lost in that. Whereas in the US, there's a small place known as Schmuckatello, right on the border of the United States and Canada. You can do your travel right from Schmuckatello all the way to Lagos and back. Or Kila in Montana. See if that's where you're from. <laughs> but you cannot do Kila in Montana to Uwe. It will terminate you in Lagos or Abuja. And so, so these, these things need, we need to come up to speed. We need to come up to speed. And if we get that right, it will get other things right. For instance, you can do Abu Dhabi, you can do Lagos to Dubai. Traveling and you get an Etihad fare. Etihad doesn't fly between Abu Dhabi and Dubai, but they've created a bus connection. So it's not just the airline industry that benefits, the other feeder industry, transport, everything. It's a value chain. And like uh, Chief said, a patron, he said something about ecosystem. That's how the world exists. That's how things are optimal. That's why the whole question about climate change and global warming is becoming a problem because everything, an ecosystem must operate optimally. But what we're doing is we do not have a 360 degree ecosystem. And that's what you as regulator must now sit down and say, what, how can we accomplish this? And we move in that direction. Uh, good morning, everyone. I would like to appreciate other speakers. I'm most profoundly thankful. And I, I'm happy being here. I'm representing my direct and regulation. That's the economy regulatory aspect of our regulatory mission. I like what the uh, barrister look at this. It's so profound, and, and that is what we are proposing. That's what we always champion as regulator. That our indigenous airlines must be, and we are getting there, must be competitive. And they must, even through, I don't want to present my presentation, that through the section that they will benefit if they are strong. Some of our workers are already doing regional uh, operations, and uh, our people are benefiting, our passengers are benefiting, which is good news. And because what we are talking about is towards 2025 and beyond. It's not just beyond 2025, because there are some actions now. Actions are already ongoing that we want to affect by 20 or before 2025 and then beyond. So what you have said is I really appreciate it. The thing is we want them to prosper and through financial authority. We are trying to get I know and by the way I will still repeat it. What we are doing is to improve on the financial health auditing to add on something so that we'll have every signal 
about any other that is expensive, that's about expensive, it's always through some indices. But now we are doing it. But the thing is, we need the cooperation of the airline to on information to provide financial information to write and do analysis. We are really doing financial work. But and then, with regard to the uh, promotion, with regard to the promotion of Ireland, we are, we are championing it because they are our own. I want them to be prosperous. So when they are prosperous, our people will benefit. We have the consumer uh, protection unit in uh, NCA. So now we have the DG of consumer protection. I would like to know the difference because we must sort that out today so that there are no conflicts. Maybe this is part of the problems we are having. That's number one. Then number two, you know, it's very easy for us to say um, the operators within the industry are not doing this right or they're not doing that right. I came from banking to join aviation and I remember then that, that we have qualification of banks. Everybody, once you can gather small money, you set up a bank. And in no time, you you amass a lot of wealth through customers' deposits, employ the, the children of the rich, and they will mobilize deposit into your bank, and you become big. And in no time, the bank will collapse. Depositors will lose their money and all that. So little came, it became a game changer. It forced everybody to align. They didn't have a choice, and they all aligned. So what I'm trying to let you know this morning is that the power belongs to the government. The government has what it takes to create an enabling environment for us to try. We are the operators. We are the business people. All we want is just an environment where business can thrive. So if you have given us an environment where business can thrive, then we will dwell there. Otherwise, we'll move somewhere else. We'll move to a better, a better place where the, the governance in that place is okay. Now, let's look at this. We want the airlines to align. We want them to synergize together. Of course, they will want to. They have their own issues. But within the government parastatals, in what way are they synergized? In what way are they working together? Are we saying that the MDAs, even with the aviation, within the aviation industry, they are working together? You need to get involved when you start to get different data from different MDAs. Does that make sense? Do we have a central data system? Does that make sense? And we want it to drive. Do you know that there is no connectivity between MM2 and MM1? As a passenger, if you have to fly, you now have to go out of the airport. I mean, come on. You can probably get stuck in traffic. And we see all these things. They are done seamlessly all everywhere around the world. So what are we talking about? What comparative advantage does a Nigerian carrier have over other airlines that are coming to Nigeria? What do they have? You tell me. I read it now because I understand the principle of comparative advantage. Are they enjoying that? If care is not taking, they probably pay more. So they are, we need to change certain things. Just the same way we make noise about changing the narratives of Nigeria, that let us speak positive about Nigeria. The government needs to do a whole lot for us. Just create for us an enabling environment. We are more than willing to work and make things happen. In because Nigerians are strong, they are resilient, and they are extremely hardworking people. Thank you very much. For me, my first analysis is that today's foundation shows an unacceptable density of government involvement in the industry. I repeat, an unacceptable density of government, a presence of government in today's foundation. If that is the situation, I think that the first thing to do is to reduce the density if we cannot totally take it out. And if today's people in government are interested in building tomorrow, they must therefore commit suicide by beginning to remove themselves. 
in order that the commanding heights of the industry must be transferred from government to the private sector. If that is the situation, therefore my position is our situation, the situation tomorrow must be under the control of the private sector. When we come to that, how would that private sector that will control the future be run? Maybe that is the point, at that point in time, that the regulatory agency will come in. Today, the regulatory agency is totally handicapped. It cannot regulate the man who owns it. SCA cannot regulate, cannot regulate farm effectively, cannot regulate them effectively. My dad used to tell us that when you see two children of the same snake fighting, move away from it because they will reconcile themselves and you become the victim. All these people are picking of the same father and they settle their problems. Some of the strongest or what are the most strongest uh, Maybe one of the regulators we have had, I think the Murray once said there was something they wanted to resolve about pricing. It was with fun. And then they discussed today, the next day they were going to come to continue the discussion. Fan called him and said there was no need. The minister has approved the rate. <laughs> it, 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 just to know what one is talking about. So first, government must be taken out of the system I'm not talking about Mark me, I'm not talking about revolution. It's not hate speech because the bid is still there and they're going in a process. All that I'm talking about is that we should make a conscious effort to swap out the intensity of government in the system and reduce it completely. To the audience, all I invited guests, President of Nanta, appreciate you, Bella. Our brother, always there, and your members who are also our members, you are also a member of this body. Thank you. So thank you very much for coming. Every organization represented in the press in particular, you are always there having our back. And when we finish from here, you start your own job. Thank you very, 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 very much. We appreciate you all the time. We thank everybody who has been here today, and um, we use this opportunity to tell you that we will announce the dates of the next quarterly meeting for the new year because we are yet to decide on that owing to so many, to a few factors. We appreciate all of you for coming and we say you have a very lovely day. Thank you all.